it's impossible to explain the satisfaction, actually the joy I've experienced being a giant. Oh, bless you. Thank you. But did you like it though? Did you double tap? No, I, I want you to go back and like the picture. Who in the hell is Mel Kiper? I don't like Welcome back to the Pan Am Football Draft Hub. I'm Max Dean. And you can find me on Twitter, at Pan Am Football. Now, today we are doing our third video in the AFC South Divisional Deep Dive Series, the draft analytics for the Tennessee Titans. If you like what you see, throw me a like. I am putting a lot of work into this. And if you want more, just hit subscribe because we are going to be doing every single team in the NFL over the next 7-8 weeks, along with salary cap videos for every single one as part of the Divisional Deep Dive series. So if you want to know about your team, this is going to tell you a lot about what it is that they're trying to accomplish and what they've done so far. I would also suggest checking out other teams because it's going to give you some insight into what your team is doing better than them in certain areas and some things that you might say, hey, I want my team to start doing that. So the Houston Texans, they fall under what I call reactionary. Now this is a strategy that is not something that any team wouldn't want to consider them to be part of, um, but I can't help but see it in the way that the Tennessee Titans are doing their business in the front office. Now the Titans have had success and that's riding on the shoulders of a few players and their coach, I think. But I want to explain to you why the Titans fall under reactionary, which essentially means that whatever their plan is or was, they've deviated from it without a clear, you know, and defined reason for doing things. Now, not, I genuinely believe that it's it's possible to win in the NFL with a number of different building strategies, but much like anything else in life that you want to you know, be successful at, and it involves a lot of people and communication, you need to know what it is that you want to accomplish and have a clear path to get there. Now, everything doesn't go exactly like you want, but what you do need to do is have basically situational responses that fall within your building strategy. If you arrive in a situation that didn't go exactly how you had hoped, you need to have a, a backup plan that works within that building strategy. Whereas with this reactionary, what will tend to happen that I, you know, the way that I'm looking at it and interpreting it is that teams are pivoting and getting away from their own strategy. And I feel like the Titans have been fortunate to stay as good as they are right now. But continuing on this path is risky for me. So let's go through and I'll explain why. So to start things off, Mike Rabel came over the new head coach in 2018. He was previously the defensive coordinator in Houston. He's had three seasons, compiled a 29-19 and 19 record with two playoff appearances and a 2-2 two and two playoff record. I think Mike Rabel is a plus coach. I like him as a coach. I like him as the Titans coach. Um, I'm, I'm glad for him that they found Ryan Tannehill because that is essentially a godsend. Um, they were going 9-7 and seven pretty consistently, and then they ended up going 9-7 and seven last year. Uh, or in 2019, I should say, but with drastic improvement down the stretch and played very well in the playoffs. Last year, they essentially picked up where they left off and went to the playoffs again, although they didn't win a playoff game this particular time. So, uh, you know, a 29-19 record is solid, and playoff appearances in two out of three years is not bad either. Now, John Robinson has been there a little bit longer. He joined in 2016, 
So the year after Marcus Mariota was drafted. He's had six true off-seasons for drafts and free agency. He has compiled a 47-33 and 33 record and has three playoff appearances over that time with a 3-3 three and three record. So he made it to the playoffs with the previous coach before Vrabel just one time, although they did win a playoff game. So in Robinson's first draft back in 2016, the Titans did collect a number of high-impact players. Jack Conklin, tackle in the first round, who's been their right tackle for a number of years before moving on to the Browns. Derrick Henry, obviously the incredible running back from Alabama, 6'5", 250, or whatever it is that, that he measures out at. And he's just a dominant force. And then Kevin Bayard, I would say, is their second most impactful player for them, the safety from Middle Tennessee State. And he's been among the best uh, safeties in the NFL for the majority of his career. I think he had a little bit of a down year last year, but still a high-impact player. You look at this and you say there are some things that we definitely like here. Every draft class is different, and it's important to look at each one and and get some notes about it and look at it as a whole, because not every draft class has to fit every category to fit into the greater uh, team building process. But early on, they go with tackle, edge defender, interior defensive lineman uh, with their first three picks. So they go premium positions with their top three picks. They've accumulated a number of second round picks along with a third round pick. I believe that that was because they traded down early in the first round since they had already gotten Marcus Mariota the year before, uh, and they had a very high pick, so they traded out for someone to go get and uh, go up and get a quarterback. Number of late round picks as well. So premium positions early, I like it. A lot of premium picks, I like it, and then a good number of overall selections as well. Coming into 2017. Corey Davis, wide receiver from Western Michigan, and Janu Smith, I would say, are their most impactful players from this draft. Uh, Jayon Brown has been a good player as well, and I believe he re-signed with them for a one-year contract, the linebacker from UCLA. Adoree Jackson has been up and down and a bit of a disappointment. They uh, released him, even though it would have been the year for his fifth-year option, Corey Davis, um, left in free agency, even though this would have been his fifth-year option year. They also declined the fifth-year option for Jack Conklin from the year before. So all three of their top picks in the in their first two drafts have moved on to other organizations. And I just, I'm not sure that, you know, that represents necessarily the best way to go about team building um but you know they are saved in large part due to the ryan Tannehill uh, trade i just if that wasn't the case and these guys would be moving on like this i'm not sure you would have a lot to go on now this is where we start to see a few things that i am not as high on a linebacker in the first round is not really it's not a big deal uh, if you're not doing it consistently. Rashawn Evans out of Alabama. Um, Alabama is known for putting out high-level linebackers, so I can understand being confident in, in making that selection. And then Harold, Harold Landry has definitely been their best uh, addition from this draft, the edge from Boston College. Um, they run a 3-4, so he's more of an outside linebacker type edge. But then you look at it and they have no picks in the third or fourth round at all. And only one in the fifth and sixth respectively. So a four-man draft class is not something I really ever want to see. I don't care if you're trading up to get a guy you're in love with. If you're doing that, you need to hedge your bets and draft a higher number of players overall. I'm not saying every draft class needs to be 9 or 10, but... 9 or 10 need to be your high volume classes and then when you're looking at your low volume classes that needs to be at least 6 or 7 in my opinion so if you want to trade up and go a little bit less 
you still need more than just four picks. It just doesn't give you the depth in case these guys don't work out. 2019 is another year that was really important for where the team is now. Two top-notch players with our first two picks. A.J. Brown from Mississippi is, or Ole Miss, is one of the best wide receivers in the NFL. And Jeffrey Simmons from Mississippi State has been uh, a really, really good interior defender in his second year. Um, I believe he was injured to some degree in 2019 and came on strong in 2020. So he's a core part of their defense. And wide receiver A.J. Brown is one of the trio that makes up their their very successful offense over the past couple of years. So 2020, up to this point, has not really been the best draft class for them. Isaiah Wilson, tackle from Georgia, was a total bust. Played one game and is now out of the NFL. And Christian Fulton, definitely not a bust, but only played in six games last year. I believe he had some injury issues as well. So their top two picks, not a lot of impact. And nobody else on you know in this class was super significant early on in their careers. So this is kind of where I'm looking at the reactionary style of, uh, of team building. It's kind of, it's certainly a good example of it. So you look back and you drafted Jack Conklin with your first ever pick as a general manager. Yeah, you have an expensive tackle on the other side, but because you decided not to use the fifth year option on Jack Conklin, he ends up moving on in free agency to the Browns. And I'm not saying that not using that fifth year option was a bad move. He had had some injury issues, so I can understand why you wouldn't have wanted to commit to that. But I believe that they did have opportunities to try and get him extended at some point throughout the season. Um, when you realize how important that right tackle position is to your rushing attack, which is the majority of your offense, that should have been a priority. When you got into free agency, you couldn't compete with the other teams because you had to make a number of high-level signings just to your own roster. You had to focus on Ryan Tannehill. You had to focus on Derrick Henry. You got yourself into a position in the draft where you felt like you had to take a tackle to fill that spot because you felt like you had to take a tackle. The class with a tremendous number of tackles that all went off the board before you got to select, uh, you know, and you just went with Isaiah Wilson. It just, it obviously didn't work out, and I just feel like that's a reactionary draft pick. They lose Malcolm Butler, they draft Christian Fulton. I don't want to say that's a bad pick because we haven't really, you know, seen him develop yet, but losing a player, losing a veteran player should not be your immediate response of going out and drafting his replacement ideally you want to be looking and drafting guys that you know you're going to have to give up on in a little while like you want to have a little bit of crossover time so you're not throwing rookies into the fire so again we're looking at a similar situation in 2021 they're trying to immediately replace players who have departed for various reasons with early round draft picks because Adoree Jackson had his fifth-year option picked up, but then was released. They now have no real answer at corner. Their number one corner going into the draft, I believe, was Christian Fulton, a guy who was a second-round pick and played in less than half of the games in the season. And then they cut, or actually, I guess they, they traded away for a seventh-round pick, Isaiah Wilson, because he was just a total bust who wasn't interested in football. So they turn around, draft a corner in the first round, and a tackle in the second round. The issue with this is that if for whatever reason these guys are not ready to compete immediately, those start to become weak positions on your roster. If Caleb Farley's injury issues are not fully solved by the time the season starts, and you know Dylan Raddins from North Dakota State, who is a guy with talent, but has not played any real high-end competition comparatively to what he'll be seeing in the NFL and barely played last year because 
they just they were not a power five school so they just really didn't get a chance to play football because of covid so you know to me this is these are great players potentially but drafting them with the expectation to start year one which is basically the position that they're in is that's very reactionary to me they haven't built themselves up a pipeline of players and I just I'm not seeing any kind of clear and and consistent path to their success and to be perfectly honest if they didn't trade for Ryan Tannehill I don't know what the state of this team would be in right now I really don't I know that they probably have lost some talent in free agency because of the cost of Ryan Tannehill that they weren't necessarily expecting. But at the same time, if Marcus Mariota had worked out, you'd be paying him at least this much, if not more. So there's really no excuse to to, to not realize you're going to be in the position you're in. And then, you know, signing Derrick Henry long-term, he's an incredible player. But... He plays a position and he plays with a violence that just do not lend itself to longevity in the NFL. Because of what he is, he may never be the same starting at literally any point for the rest of his career and it wouldn't be a surprise or a shock. Because of his running style and what it is that gets their offense going, if they lose his impactfulness, they lose everything. And I like Ryan Tannehill. I really do. But their entire offense is based around the dominance of Derrick Henry. And I just... I feel like that's just such a recipe for disaster. And I'm hopeful that they don't have that decline. Because they're a fun team to watch now. They're physical. Um, I really like how they've known what they're doing on offense. They've had that identity with Tannehill and A.J. Brown and, and Derrick Henry. But I'm also concerned that without consistently developing and maintaining talent, that might not last. So as we move into the analytics, their first round selections have been 86% premium positions. So that would be quarterback, wide receiver, tackle, interior defensive lineman, edge, and corner. Everyone else plays a non-premium position. So... They've invested pretty heavily in premium positions. That's good for third best in the NFL. I do like to see a little bit, at least over 50% in terms of premium position investment. You don't want to say that you need to use every pick on a premium position just because you do need to take risks in certain areas. So I'm in the past, I think I was a little bit more intense on it, but as, it is, as I've really looked at team building over the past few years and seen where teams have been successful, you don't necessarily need to go premium position every year. You don't need to go 100% of the year because inevitably, you know, you're, you're going to have really good players at non-premium positions that you don't want to pass on, and I'm okay with that. But if you want to maximize your salary cap, you definitely need to be doing it over 50%. What else stands out here for them? Um, Offensive line, they're tied for sixth most investment uh, with first round picks. So they've taken two tackles under John Robinson in the first round. Fortunately, one didn't work out and one uh, moved on in free agency. So they're still a bit tackle poor, which is pretty crazy. And then defensive skill positions make up the majority of their first round picks at 43%, tied for third most in the NFL. So those defensive skill would be corner, safety, and linebacker. And I believe that they've used two picks on corners and one pick on an off-ball linebacker in the first round. So one of my favorite analytics is premium round selection. So picks in rounds one through three, it just gives you more Uh, data and rounds one through three are the backbone of building your team premium positions 67 percent. i feel like that is a really good number it's good for fourth best in the nfl but it means that you are still investing in non-premium positions to some degree you can't just totally ignore them um 
But overall, I think that their their investment level in premium positions is about spot on where you want to be, especially in the first round and then just a little less in the premium rounds. You want to be hitting those premium positions. And this is something that I do like that they've done successfully. They go a bit more defense heavy, but not by a huge margin. So they're around middle of the pack for both. And then something that um, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not my personal style. Not drafting any quarterback in all of those drafts in the first three rounds. Now, I do understand that you had Marcus Mariota, but I do not think that you should go through the drafts and especially if you're not sold on a guy, just ignore the position in the premium rounds. Even if you're looking for a possible developmental guy in the third round, that would be a good opportunity to add to your team a guy that might be an important backup. You could do it in the fourth round. You could do it in the fifth round. So let's keep an eye on that when we get to um, the full draft analytic so that we can see if they're at least doing it there. For the rest, they're all pretty well in the middle of the pack. They're pretty evenly spaced out, um, despite the fact that they do invest more in the defensive skill positions than any of their other positions. It's still 12th best in the NFL, or 12th most, I should say. So it's not, you know, substantially more. They're one of the more evenly rounded teams in terms of uh, core by core position uh, investment. So now when looking at all rounds, so rounds one through seven, some of the things that I was talking about have kind of come to fruition. The quarterback investment has moved up to tied for fifth. And so that means that they're investing pretty consistently over their drafts in the later rounds. Now, I'm okay with that. I want consistent quarterback investment, um, and they've managed to do that. They've maintained a over 50% um, investment in premium positions at 65%. That's second in the NFL. The one thing I would say about that is that if you're as high as they are in the first round and the premium rounds, so I believe it was 80 85% or something, and uh, 67% respectively. You might want to be a little bit lower in your percentage once you factor in all of the rounds, just because you need you need to invest in, in non-premium positions as well. You can't just ignore that. So that's one thing that I would point out. Everywhere else, they're pretty well spaced out. You know, still defense heavy. In fact, more so once you get through all of these picks. And then defensive line, 21%. That's tied for fourth best in the NFL. So that means that they're consistently looking to the later rounds for defensive linemen because they haven't been super high ranked in defensive line investment in any of the others. So to jump up like that, that means they're putting in more there. So when looking at all of their drafts, the Tennessee Titans under John Robinson have averaged 7.17 picks per draft. That's not really where I would like it to be. Um, it just doesn't give you the maximum opportunity to build depth in your roster. If you have expensive players, if you know you're about to have expensive core players, this is the ideal and best way to add depth to your roster. Guys who you're taking in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth rounds are so cheap compared to what you're getting in free agency. And so that's your opportunity to get better and have that depth. In the first round, they've had 1.17 picks per draft. Now, that's basically one first round pick per draft. And I think they had two first round picks in one of their drafts. And that's fine. I don't think that Having multiple first round picks is necessarily a big deal. I think it matters a lot more for a rebuilding team than a long term team. You know, to me, if you're if you're a team that's years deep into your you know build cycle and you get two first round picks, that's the perfect opportunity to 
trade down as much as possible and accumulate a bunch of second and third round picks. If you want to you spend one on a player and then move down as much as possible, that's ideal. Premium rounds, three and a half picks per draft. That's tied for fifth best in the NFL. See, that's something I like. And we we saw that when we were looking through the drafts. Multiple second round picks at various times. But then when you get to late round picks, they only have 3.67 per draft. That's just not good enough. You know, that's that's where you're taking swings on a lot of these players. And 3.67, like I said, in one draft is fine. But if that's what you're averaging over all the years that you've been doing this, you need to spend more picks. You need to bring more guys. And I mean, even worst case scenario, they don't end up making the roster. They're later picks. It's not it's not a big deal, but you've given yourself an opportunity to get better that if you don't do that, you're literally just ignoring a chance to improve your team. There should always be a higher percentage of late round picks than premium round picks. And this is nearly split down the middle. I want to see more on the back end. And I'm not saying just get a whole bunch of seventh round picks. Just, just get a bunch of seven round picks. Again, I've said before, it doesn't hurt you to do that, but no, it's not the most ideal way to go about it, but you have opportunities throughout the draft. Teams are always interested in trading up in various times. You have the ability to accumulate these later picks. So I would like to see them just do a little bit more of that. All right, so that was the Tennessee Titans under John Robinson. And I think you'll be able to see a bit more of this reactionary style when we look at the salary cap coming up. The Titans are heavily focused on a few players. They're a bit top-heavy, and they've been lucky to accumulate some of those guys. I mean, spending a pick on Derrick Henry, that was good, but he's also five years deep at this point, and this is going to be his sixth year in the NFL. Running backs have a notoriously short life cycle. Aside from that, you have a somewhat injury-prone left tackle, and you're incredibly lucky that this franchise quarterback fell into your lap. And I know, yeah, you had to go out and spend a draft pick to trade for him, but even if Ryan Tannehill was just fine, just a fine player, it still would have been a good trade, but you wouldn't have a good team right now. You would have had a not very good Marcus Mariota and a fine quarterback, but... The fact that Ryan Tannehill has worked out has been a godsend for them. So check back later this week for the Titan salary cap video. And uh, we're about to be putting out the last AFC South video, which is the Jacksonville Jaguars.